Okay, hello once again, complex students. We have a couple more type of functions to define and discuss in this lecture, those being the hyperbolic functions and the inverse trigonometric functions. So the hyperbolic sine and the hyperbolic cosine functions are going to be defined sort of analogously to the real valued versions of them. So sine cinch z or hyperbolic sine of z will be e to the z minus e to the negative z over two. And the hyperbolic cosine will be e to the z plus e to the negative z all over two. So this is exactly the way they're defined for real numbers, just with x in place of z. Since we know how to differentiate e to the z, you quickly discover that the derivative of cinch is cosh, and also the derivative of cosh is cinch. So we get derivative rules very similar to regular sine and cosine, but with the missing sign. In other words, the derivative of cosh is not negative cinch like it would be for the regular trigonometric functions. And I'm listing some identities here that, for lack of a better name, I'm calling them conversion identities. They tell us how to convert you know, regular trigonometric sine into cinch, and vice versa. If, if you want to convert from cinch to regular sine, you can do it that way too. And same thing for cosine and cosh. There's just some multiples of i involved to convert from one to the other, which is kind of cool because it gives rise to a whole slew of identities. You can basically take all of the old identities that we have for trigonometric functions and then make the appropriate substitution here and get identities for hyperbolic functions. It's also worth noting that cinch of z and cosh of z both have a period of 2 pi due to the fact that sine and cosine both have a period of 2 pi and then we have these identities where you're multiplying times i on the inside of the function. So it just comes down to that. You get some negative angle identities here. Cinch of negative z is negative cinch of z, and cosh of negative z is just cosh of z. So those identities are very you know identical to the ones for sine and cosine. You get sort of a version of the Pythagorean identity with a minus sign in the middle. So cosh squared minus cinch squared equals 1. You get a s sort of sum identity for both cinch and cosh, which are very similar to the ones for sine and cosine, but maybe some minor differences in sines. The ones at the very bottom there, if you break z into x, you know, x plus i, y, and then you can write the cosh and the cinch, you know, we can figure out what their component functions are, and they involve cinches and coshes and sines and cosines. So anyway, you can see what the component functions are at the bottom. All of these identities, I mean, they're all we basically inherit them for free from the old identities and, and using our conversion identities at the top. And then also you see um, identities for the modulus squared of both cinch and cosh at the bottom. And just like with sine and cosine, you can see that those the cinch and the cosh are unbounded because of the terms, because of the cinch squared terms can go to infinity as x grows large. So these are unbounded functions, just like their trigonometric cousins. And so on this page, it's just to point out how you can verify some of these identities by using the conversion identities. So for example, if I wanted to verify that sum of angles identity for cosh, wouldn't be hard. Just use the appropriate identity. Well, cosh of z1 plus z2, if I would use this identity underlined in blue there, then I could write that as cosine of i times z1 plus z2. And of course I can distribute that i inside there. And then I can use the sum of angles identity for cosine, which is, so I'd get cosine iz1, cosine iz2, then there's a minus, then you do sine of iz1, sine of i z2. And now I can convert back the other way with the conversion identities and you know I see that cosine of i z I can convert back to cosh. So these first two terms here would be this cosh z1 and then cosh of z2. And then on the signs I've got that identity on the upper left here 
And by dividing both sides of that identity by negative i, I'd get sine of i z1 is 1 over negative 1 over i cinch of z1. And similarly, the second term there is negative 1 over i cinch of z2. And if you sort of keep track of all the negatives that are floating around in there, when you multiply that negative 1 over i times negative 1 over i, that becomes 1 over i squared, which is 1 over negative 1. So you end up with two negatives that cancel out, and so there's a plus in the middle. And so you end up at cosh z1, cosh z2, then it becomes plus, and then you got cinch z1, cinch z2, as advertised. So anyway, that gives you the spirit of how any of, basically any of those identities that w would be defined, or you don't have to do it that way. I suppose you could do it from the definitions, but since those identities already exist and we can have this conversion factor, it kind of makes it easy. Here's another example. We could verify the one that gives us the, the value of the modulus of cosh squared. Okay, to verify this identity, starting with cosh of z modulus squared, you know, we convert cosh z into cosine using the identity up here in the upper right. Cosh of z is equal to cosine i z. So I'll just replace that on the inside of the modulus there. And then we have an identity for the modulus of cosine of z squared. You may remember that one was cosine squared x plus cinch squared of y. So we can we can apply that here, but first we need to think about that i times z. You know, if, if z is equal to x plus i y, then we know i times z is going to be negative y plus i times x. So we kind of got to switch the role of x and y in this identity here for cosine cosine modulus squared, and then negate the first component. So you end up with this would be cosine squared of negative y and then plus cinch squared of x and then of course cosine of y, negative y is equal to cosine of y so this just ends up being cosine squared of y plus cinch squared of x as promised so yeah, taking advantage of those previous identities, we get all these new ones pretty easy peasy. The next theorem here has to do with where the zeros of the cinch and the cosh functions are. The cinch is equal to zero at multiples of pi i. The zeros of cosh are start at i pi over 2 and then add multiples of pi i to that. And then it's not hard to prove. You can just use the fact, you know, about the zeros of the sine and cosine functions that we already know, and then just use those conversion identities, and you get this one almost for free. And of course, we have other hyperbolic functions. We can have a hyperbolic tangent. We'll call it tanch. I'm not sure if that's how you ought to say it really or not, but that's what, what I'm going to call it. So tanch is just cinch over cosh. And there's hyperbolic cotangent, which I'm going to call cotch. And that's the hyperbolic cosh, or just cosh over cinch. The hyperbolic secant, sech, that'll be 1 over the cosh. And the hyperbolic cosecant, I'm not sure how you pronounce that one, cush. Cush is 1 over cinch. And of course, you know, we know the the derivative of cinch is cosh and the derivative of cosh is cinch and since we know that and we have differentiation rules then we get that all these other functions are differentiable everywhere except where they're not defined and it should be tanch there um, but yeah we get the, the following derivatives just by using differentiation rules derivative of tanch is such squared just like sort of the trigonometric relative of it. The derivative of Koch, should be an H in there, is negative Cush squared. The derivative of Sech is negative Sech times Tanch. And the derivative of Cush is negative Cush times Koch.
So, you know, very similar to the derivatives of the regular trigonometric functions, just with some differences in signs. And then lastly, we can look at the in inverses of all these trig and hyperbolic functions. We'll just restrict ourselves to the sine, cosine, and tangent, and then the cinch, cosh, and tanch. It turns out, though, that um, surprisingly, well, maybe not surprisingly, I mean, these are all, exp like, all these functions that we define, the cinch, the cosh, the tanch, and then also sine, cosine, and tangent, they were all defined in terms of exponential functions. So it's not terribly surprising, then, that their inverses will involve logarithms, because the inverse of the exponential function is a logarithm, right? I'm just listing what the inverses actually work out to in terms of logarithms here. And in each one of those, you got to understand that logarithm itself is a multivalued function. And also, you see some square roots in there on the sine inverse and the cosine inverse, and also on the cinch inverse and the cosh inverse. There's a the one-half exponent, so we're getting some square roots. Those also have two values, so these are multivalued functions on more than one level here. And to give you a sense of how all these formulas sort of come about, we'll, we'll work through one of them for the cinch of z. I'm sorry. Uh, let's do sine inverse of z. Got a little mismatch here in my notes. So we're going to work out how, to, how do we get that formula for sine inverse of z. By the way, it's kind of interesting that all these formulas work out for real numbers, too, whenever you restrict z to be a real number. Okay, so if you give the inverse sine function the name w, then if you say w equals sine inverse of z, that's the same as saying z equals sine of w. And we know sine of w, by definition, is e to the i w minus e to the negative i w over 2 times i. So then I'm going to take this last equation. Let me highlight the part of it that I'm going to play with. I'm going to take the fact that these two things in blue are equal to one another and rewrite that equation in a way that's kind of nice. Um, you know, that term right there, e to the negative iw, is really 1 over e to the iw, right? So one thing I could do is like multiply both sides of that equation by e to the iw to clear fractions. And I could also multiply both sides by 2i. So let me do that in two steps. First, multiply both sides by 2i, and I get z times 2i equals e to the iw minus e to the negative iw. Then multiply both sides by e to the iw to clear fractions, and you end up with 2zi times e to the iw equals e to the i w squared minus 1. And then we can put everything on one side of the equation like this. We'll have e to the i w squared minus 2 z i times e to the i w minus 1 equals 0. And you can think of that as a quadratic equation, where the variable is, I don't know, maybe say a you let a equal e to the i w, it becomes kind of clear that this equation is a quadratic equation, and you can do the quadratic formula. Let me just go down here and do a little scratch work at the bottom. The quadratic formula says a would have to be negative b, so that's 2zi plus or minus the square root. Of course, instead of using square root, I'm going to use the one-half power. And then you, you do b squared, so that'd be negative 4z squared minus 4 times the a, you know, the coefficient of the squared term, which would be 1, times negative 1, like that. And so that's to the 1 half, all over 2. And so let's see if we can simplify that a bit. 2zi plus and minus. You could pull the square root of 4 out of there, so you'd have a 2. I guess you could factor negative 4 out and take the half root of it. I'll just pull the, the 4 out and then take the root of it and you get 2 and then z squared yeah there's a negative so you get 1 minus z squared to the 1 half over 2 and then you can cancel the 2 off and you end up with i times z instead of putting plus or minus I'm going to just put the plus because you know the 1 half exponent keeps track of both roots <laughs> 
So you just end up with that. And so that's what your A has to equal. So you end up with E to the IW has to equal IZ plus one minus Z squared to the one half. Bearing in mind that that one half is actually two values, or that one half power gives you two values. And then you can take the logarithm of both sides and then divide both sides by I, and you get W equals one over I log IZ plus one minus Z squared to the one half. I think that's the answer we were supposed to get. Let me check at the top there. Oh, well they put negative I. So one over I is equal to negative I. So negative I there, and you're done. So all of those equations are derived in a similar fashion by setting up the appropriate equation where e to the iw equals something, and then you take logs. Or maybe the, maybe it's not e to the iw, maybe it'll end up just being e to the w if we're talking about the hyperbolic ones. And then you take a log. So that's why on the log ones you don't get a multiple of i out front. But anyway, yeah, they're all derived basically the same way. And we could talk briefly about the derivatives of the inverse trigonometric functions. If you go back to the previous page and you look at the formulas that we had for inverse sine that involved the logarithm, you can differentiate that. We know what the derivative, you know, derivative of log is one over z, right? So you just apply that formula and you end up getting some familiar formulas from calculus class. You end up with the derivative of sine inverse is one over the square root of one minus c squared. For cosine, it's very similar. You just get a difference in sine. So it'd be derivative of cosine inverse is negative one over one minus c squared to the negative one half, or to the one half. And the derivative of tangent inverse, just like in calculus class, is one over one plus z squared. So, you know, those are handy whenever you're doing integrals of functions that involve square roots. Of course, got a little, a few notes over here. The first two formulas involve square roots, so the value that you get for the derivative there depends on which branch of the square root function you choose. When you do square roots, there's always two roots, right? So, you got to make a choice first, and then you know, you get your derivative based on which choice you made for the branch. For the tangent inverse, though, it doesn't really matter because there's no square roots involved. Um, you do have to at the beginning of like when you look at back at the formula for tangent inverse, tangent inverse is defined in terms of a log, right? Which is multi-valued. So you have to choose a value of the log to make the tangent function differentiable. But once you choose a branch of the logarithm, it, it doesn't matter make a difference what branch you chose. You always get the same derivative, one plus one over z squared. Whereas with the sine and inverse Inverse sine and inverse cosine, it does make a difference what branch you choose initially. That determines what branch you get for your derivative. Okay. Well, I think that's all I've got to talk about with those functions. So at this point, though, we got all of the standard functions that you've ever seen in calculus class that we use for everything. Um, they're all defined, and we know how to make sense of them. We know how to pick roots, you know, or pick um, branches of them where they're differentiable and Basically, all the calculus is the same as it always was. And so now we're ready to go on and do integrals. So I'll stop there. Talk to you again soon. Bye.